Welcome back to the channel guys, hope everyone's doing well and happy new year. So this mesh-tastic off-grid messaging thing seems to have taken off really well and you guys seem to be absolutely loving it. So you can see here that loads of new stations popped up even in my local area. Look, we've actually got one over here, one over here and this little cluster is mine in the middle. It's so cool, isn't it? So you can see day by day, more and more people coming onto the system. That's gonna help the mesh expand. Now, if you've already grabbed some of these devices, you've got them set up, you've got mesh-tastic firmware running on them, but you're not seeing any activity in your area, don't worry, I'm gonna give you some tips on how to maximize your mesh-tastic contacts. But first I wanna talk about how to get hold of these devices if you haven't already, because it has been a bit of an issue of late. Amazon have basically sold out of these now, <laughs> probably due to the video, but there's been a massive uptake in the UK, so that's probably why. The only other place you can really get them at the moment, we're looking at other solutions, but the only other place is AliExpress. It takes about two weeks to come, but you know, you're guaranteed a pretty good price from there because they come from China. Anyway, I will leave some updated links below for getting these. And also there's a link below for another device that I really like at the moment, which runs Meshtastic, which is this LilyGo T Echo. These are absolutely brilliant. They've got a battery built in, so you don't have to worry about batteries. They've also got like an antenna socket on the top, so you can you know, use external antennas. Um, you can see an SMA connector under there. These ones use an updated chipset as well, so it's a little bit easier to manage. And also the power consumption is about a third of the Heltex, which is really good if you want to run them in remote places and you want the batteries to last a really long time. And these have got a really cool e-ink display, which is obviously really good on the power consumption, a little capacitive button on there, which you can tap and it refreshes the screen. And they've even got a backlight as well which is super bright and kind of doubles as a bit of a torch. It makes it really clear and easy to see. So let's talk about the current status of the Meshtastic network um, as it stands today, 2nd of, 2nd of January, 2024. So if we head over to this canvas map here, this is basically a community driven map and you can already see this has increased a lot since the last time um, I made a video about this, which wasn't even that long ago. So there's lots of stations kind of appeared in here. Um, you can see these lines here, which are showing that there's links between those ones. Um, you can draw these on so this is completely community driven so it's nothing to do with like it's not getting data from the network or anything like that it's not that advanced so it's just showing you where kind of activity is you can see there's little clusters of activity um, around the UK so like some in Southampton it's a bit annoying this the way it does that when you hover over it but you've got Southampton here um, you know there's sort of sort of bit bit of activity over there as well um over near was that gloucester way and then obviously my little area around here and obviously there's a few stations in london so this is increasing all the time but basically the long and short of it there's a lot more stations than there were um about a month ago and what you've got to remember guys is it's driven by us it's driven by you guys and whoever's using the network so if you're sort of sitting around on the fence going well there's no activity in my area and um, there's no point well be the first you know if you're in a high location you might end up bridging to two kind of meshes and becoming a really pivotal part of the network. And that sort of brings me on to another thing because to make this work, obviously you need quite a lot of nodes in an area and like if you get kind of a bit obsessed with it like me then you you kind of have loads of these dotted around in in um, kind of families houses set them up in lofts and just try and you know get the get the coverage as much as possible i don't know why it must be something to do with the old cb days um and the sort of you know the fascination of making contacts with with others and kind of seeing how far your signal would get all, all of that it's definitely something that really resonates with the radio crowd i'm calling it cb 2.0 at the moment i don't know why but anyway but yeah essentially to make this work, you've got to have a lot of devices around and a lot of devices on 24 seven, ideally. So that's the other thing, just switching sort of nodes on to see who's around and then turning them off again, is not really gonna be that helpful. So the best thing to do is to leave these on 24 seven in a really good location if you can, or maybe just stuck to a window up high, you know, those are the locations that are really good. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And if you do that, you'll increase the chances of you getting heard because these devices beacon. By default, they beacon every three hours. You can change that. Um, it might affect your duty cycle limits and stuff like that, but you can change that to beacon a bit more frequently so you, there's a chance that you'll get heard a bit more often. And if you do that and leave it running, you know, you might come back and you might see on your smartphone or when you log into this device, you might see that you've made, you know, 
a bunch of connections and there are actually stations in your area and that's the key thing because it might not immediately be obvious mainly because of those default settings the beacons every three hours you know you could be sitting there three hours before you actually hear anything so bear that in mind of course you might not be interested about making contacts on this at all with strangers some people might find that weird um you know it's not for me because i'm a radio ham and i like to talk to other people that are into the same stuff as me and you will find quite a lot of like-minded people hanging out in the on the primary channels and um, there's been some really cool chats i've had with, with kind of locals and i've got to know them really well and they're sort of into the same stuff as me and i think that's really cool in this sort of modern world where everyone's just obsessed with privacy all the time it's a good thing but you know it can make you a little bit kind of insular so let's have a quick look at channel settings for Meshtastic. So you can see here, this is my main list of conversations that I've got going on. Um, so you can see here, uh, we've got Longfast, which is generally the standard place for, for kind of, you know, primary chat, uh, which anyone can kind of type in and anyone will see that. It depends on your modem mode, um, what you'll see here, whether that says long fast or long slow or whatever. But essentially that is the main place that you can kind of, you know, talk to random people <laughs> if you like um, now the other one you'll see up here i've got one here which is actually set to uk wide now this is something i'm going to talk about a bit later this is actually a server which is on the internet um, which allows you to connect nodes via the internet so this might be useful for some of the that haven't got any nodes in the local area um, and you might want to just hop on using an internet connection um, you know connecting your node to the internet via your Wi-Fi so that you can actually kind of, you know, see some activity. That kind of keeps keeps the interest going a bit, I think. So if we go into the radio configuration menu and then we go to channels, what you see here is, once that loads, you'll see I've got two channels set up. By default, you'll have one, and that's all you've got to worry about. Don't change this, don't touch this, if you want to be seen and heard by other people. If you start changing passcodes, then you'll have to match that passcode with whoever you want to talk to. So the default settings are there to basically just make communication easy between any node. If you set up a device on, on with the default settings, it will just work seamlessly with the others. If you start messing around with this passcode and everything else, then you won't actually be able to communicate with anyone else. Now, I've actually got another one set up here, which is called UK Wide, and that's something that we're testing out at the moment. But yeah, ultimately, it's going to be a place where you can chat to other people in the UK. Um, it will be linking by uh, the internet, not necessarily RF, although it will be doing RF as well, which is quite cool. Anyway, more on that a bit later. The main reason a lot of people get into this is because they're interested in the off-grid nature. They don't want to use the internet for communication. So using RF is going to be the primary kind of method for a lot of people. So let's talk more about that. So the system this runs on is actually LoRa. So this is like basically, it's called, it stands for long range. I'm not going to go too much into detail about how this works. There's loads of videos on that and it's beyond the scope of this kind of video. All you need to know is that it basically goes a very, very long way. <laughs> Um, the signals from these devices are very, very low power in the region of about 100 milliwatts. I've tested up to about 180 milliwatts output power on Raspberry Pi Pico based nodes. Um, again, probably be another video about those later on. But to put it simply, the range on these things kind of makes you think you're breaking laws of physics. It is really, really impressive. Okay, you shouldn't expect massive range in really, really built up areas. But if you can get some really good height from just one of your stations, you'll see the range dramatically increase. So the radio frequency that these operate on in the UK is actually an ISM band and it's 868 megahertz. And this allocation is actually an ISM band, so it is license free. So any of you that have been into mining the cryptocurrency Helium will be familiar with this. It runs on the same frequency band as that. And also Helium uses LoRa as well. Why am I telling you this? Well, the reason I'm telling you this, guys, is because although the Helium network is dying a bit of a death at the moment, there's actually quite a lot of data that you can get from the Helium tools that will give you an idea of how well your Meshtastic station could work. So on this website here, mappers.helium.com, this basically shows you a map which is split up into little hexagons. And each of these hexagons will have some data attached to it to show you what sort of range you would get if you had a station in that area. 
area. Now this has kind of got to be taken with a pinch of salt, but basically if you click on any of these hexagons here on a map, you'll see potential places where your signal could go. These are ones that have actually been logged on 868 megahertz on the Helium network previously. And these, this is done by a, a thing called a mapper. And the thing is with this, you don't really know what antennas these stations would have been actually using at the time of that log. And obviously look, two years ago here as well. But if you click around on this map, you get some really interesting things happening. Look, so this is obviously center of London somewhere where maybe that's up, up a high rise or up some sort of office block or something like that. But look at the range. You know, when this was logged, look, he was getting out from the center of London right over to kind of, you know, South London way, Coulston, um, you know, some of these ones up here, which are quite impressive. It, you know, it is very, very interesting to sort of look at this data and kind of work out. Look, look at that one over there, all the way over across there. So this is 100 milliwatts. I mean, actually, this is not 100 milliwatts because the Helium Network um, mapper that I've got, I've tested it about 40 milliwatts, so that's even less. <laughs> but this gives you an idea of what is achievable with Meshtastic. Um, and yeah, it's very, very impressive. You know, if you look at some of these other hexes over here, you know, that's doing pretty well, that one there. Um, and then if we go up to where I am, see, I've done some experiments with my own mapper. If you click on that, this is my current kind of helium mapper coverage so, so <laughs> this is pretty nuts i'm getting a long way um on on that and this is exactly the same setup that i'm using for meshtastic it's nothing special it's just off the shelf lora antennas basically um but they are they are mounted quite high on the top of a mast so that shows you what you can achieve um you know on helium and meshtastic will be the same it'll be roughly the same it could be better on meshtastic because you've got slightly more output power. Those mapping results on Helium were done on a spreading factor of 12, which is the equivalent to long slow mode on uh, Meshtastic. But of course, you've got the extra output power of Meshtastic. So I would say that, you know, long fast is probably going to be similar. It could be. This is the mapper tool that I was using. It's got a built-in battery. It's kind of like a little modular thing, but it's it's a Wio Lower Wan uh, field tester. <laughs> I don't know who thinks of these names. But obviously you don't need to have one of these. You can just log into that map. Anyone can view that map. So it's a good way of using that tool, just clicking on an area where you're thinking of deploying your Meshtastic node. And you can see what sort of distances have previously been achieved from that location. It's just mind blowing really, isn't it? And bear in mind, I should think most of the helium hotspots out there that have received signals from this mapper will be using a similar antenna to this. Just a little 868 megahertz whip for lower. This is another useful tool that I use at scadacore.com. It's just for kind of doing RF line of sight graphs. So basically you can um, you can put two points on a map here and it will draw you a topography kind of um, graph here showing you how the land lies for a particular, for two particular points. So you can see here we've got a massive hill in the middle. It's not going to be great for line of sight. But then, you know, if you had the antenna up, um, 100 meters, something like that, then it's still got massive ruin. <laughs> but no, you could, you know, do do things. So maybe if, if two, two of you were using drones, that might actually be possible, you know, mesh test it device on that. But anyway, that is that is something you can play with to work out uh, what is a good position to sort of be in and, and where you're going to get to. Again, it's got to be taken with a pinch of salt. 868 megahertz is quite an interesting band as well because you get reflections off of objects and it doesn't actually deteriorate. You know, it doesn't absorb the signal as much as microwave signals do. So you can end up with like, you know, knife edge diffraction, it's called, um, bouncing off of objects. So you might find whilst this says, you know, you've got a massive hill, there's no chance, something might be around the corner and it might be reflecting your signal off. So never rule out that you might actually have a radio path, even though, you know, this sort of thing says no way mate so if you're still watching this video well done i appreciate it. there's a lot of information here so feel free to skip back and you know try and digest some of the things here um, but hopefully this is all going to help you um, on your meshtastic journey now the next thing i want to talk about is antennas now as with all hobby radio stuff antennas is an endless conversation <laughs> Trust me, it just it will go on forever. You'll never get to the bottom of it. There'll always be things that you're going to learn about antennas. And that, for me, is one of the most fun things about the hobby is making new antennas. They're cheap to make. You can try different things, 
do range tests and all that stuff, it's all good fun. So if you're someone that doesn't really like to experiment with stuff too much, you might have a limited experience because you are gonna be sort of limited to what you've actually got. So with the Heltec nose, which I've done lots of content on, if you've watched the other videos, you'll know that there's an antenna in here, um, which is connected to the sort of main board. So the antenna's inside the case, I'll show you in a minute if you haven't seen this before. But basically this sort of case is actually quite well designed because there's, there's a little bit of separation between the antenna and the main board. You know, it's fairly well spaced out. So if you put this up in your window and you've got a quite a good line of sight out, you should expect, you know, pretty good results. It's gonna work fairly well. You know, I've definitely seen a few kilometers out of one of these just in the window uh, with pretty good line of sight. I'm in quite a good position up here, so that is obviously gonna help. You've also got to be mindful of coatings on glass, like some sort of like office blocks and things like that. If you're thinking about operating from up there, then they might have coatings on the glass. You know, you just don't know. It's just a matter of trial and error, really. But on from that, say you want to get a little bit more range than the standard antenna. You could use a little external antenna like we saw earlier one of these, this is from a company called Paradol, which makes some great antennas for 868 megahertz. But obviously the problem with these devices, they've got no antenna socket, um, unlike, you know, like the Lilygo T Echo, which has got an SMA socket. So you can actually just, you know, stick that straight on. But with these, there are ways of connecting external antennas and you basically need a little SMA pigtail. You know, I've showed how to do this in one of my other videos, but this is basically an SMA pigtail. And then you can connect that to the main board instead of the standard antenna and then somehow kind to route this out of the back of this case it can be done and then that'll basically give you an SMA socket which you can then use to connect antennas like this directly and if you're going to do that you'd probably be better off putting everything in another box or a project box or maybe even the packaging box that everything came on you know you could then maybe have the node in there and then just stick the antenna on the top and then put it somewhere or if you've got a 3d printer there's loads of designs for these already out there so once you've got a way of attaching external antennas you can then attach other antennas like this this um, home base antenna, which could go on the top of a pole outside. What you've got to be careful of when doing this is the fact that these normally come with some coax, like some cable to connect it to the device. You're gonna lose so much signal, you're pretty much gonna lose all of your receiving signals in that wire because it's just not a very good quality or it, it's very hard to deal with frequencies this high. You know, these are quite high frequencies, so you can lose a lot of RF in the cable between your node and the antenna. And because lower is such a weak signal mode, you're dealing with tiny little power levels. So, you know, you're gonna lose a lot. You know, you can literally lose like half your incoming and outgoing signals just in a bad bit of coax. So generally it's a good idea to have your node mounted literally right, right below the antenna. So if you've got it on a pole outside, put your node there. Of course, there's a whole bunch of other problems. How are you gonna power it? You know, can you make it waterproof? And, and all of those sort of things. So as you can see, this gets, gets kind of complicated quite quickly. But we'll do some more videos maybe on those on those setups. I've successfully got one running outside, um, actually just on the masthead. So, you know, I've done it and it works and it's been up there for, for, for like probably over a month now. You could put something like this up in the loft with the node directly below it. That would solve all the weatherproofing issues and it will work fairly well. Bear in mind though, you've got walls. Normally in most houses, you've got like a wall either side um, and then obviously the pitch roof. So those walls are obviously gonna affect your signal getting out in that direction because it is quite line of sight. From my experience, loft mounted antennas, even in my really good location here, eh, they don't work that great. You've still, you, it does work, but it's not anywhere near as good as it will work when it's actually in free air. Um, there's lots of reasons for that, but basically, yeah, it does attenuate quite a bit of the incoming signal. Obviously, that's the thing you're most worried about because, you know, these, these signals are really weak to start with when they hit your antenna. Um, the getting out signals, not too bad. Um, you could probably get away with it to an extent, but you're gonna have a system that is probably a bit deaf um, if you use your antenna in the loft. It can work though, don't get me wrong, it can work. I will say though that some people have actually reported that the Heltec and one of these antennas up in the loft actually works really well. So you might not need to go to the hassle of having something like that. Again, it's trial and error, experimentation is key with this stuff. Anyway, I think that's gonna be about it for this video because I've rattled on enough. Um, the conversation is flowing over on our Discord. So if you haven't already kind of joined that, look for the link below um, this video and it's, it's there, you can click on it. To get on Discord, it's nothing scary. All you've got to do 
do is just download the Discord app or basically just do it on the desktop computer. You get a good experience on that. And it's a completely free thing. There's loads of us over there talking about Meshtastic at the moment and there's loads of people to answer questions and get you up and running. It's pretty cool actually. I love hanging out there at the moment and shout out to all the regulars on there. You know who you are. So yeah guys, hope you found this useful. Let me know in the comments as always how you've been getting on with this stuff and if you've got any other questions and I'll catch you later.